UCM. This is Haley. I am a student leader here at BIU UCM and I would like to welcome you here to UCM, which is actually in my house. Um, due to the COVID-19 outbreak, we are no longer able to gather together, but that's not going to stop us from worshiping and sharing a word. So I hope that you are encouraged and blessed by this and I just want to thank you for watching. Uh, because you probably have nothing better to do with the social distancing, <laughs> but also because I think it's worth it. So I'm just going to turn it over to the worship team now. Thanks, guys.
are so lovely and you're so wonderful to us. You are good in all seasons. You are available and we can tell you our burdens. We can tell you everything that's going on. And we thank you that you care so much, that you fight for us, that you hear us, and that you are aware of all that's happening. And Lord, we pray for peace. We pray for wisdom in this season, for our leaders, for health professionals, for everyone, for people at risk, Lord, that you come and fight for us. That you are the one who fight our battles and you are the winner. You always, you never lose, Lord. We thank you that you are, you are fighting our battles and we submit all that's going on to you. And we thank you that you hear us, that you are above all. You are the King of Kings, Lord.
couple announcements for you. Actually, probably just one. Um, our one announcement is that this is going to be the last UCM of the semester. Um, we had a couple more planned originally, but as you know, everyone's plans are changing. Um, and we just don't think that this is a very sustainable thing to do every week, but we still wanted to bless you with one last gathering on the interwebs. <laughs> so this is our last UCM, but I just wanted to say thank you so much for everyone who has come out all semester, everyone who has served. You guys are fantastic. Um, and it just truly is just such an amazing community to be part of. And I have been so blessed by hearing about how God is moving in your lives. Um, and just by the worship and just seeing everyone use their gifts. And so I just want to thank everyone and I want to invite everyone back for next year. Yeah, do any of you guys want to do any final words? This is totally on the spot, so. <laughs> Oop. <laughs> um, yeah, I think what Haley said, just like, thanks for everything that has, I don't know, everyone's been super welcoming this year and that's been really amazing. So thank you guys so much for that. And yeah. And Julie? And stay Wait. tuned for next year and keep praying. God's gonna continue to do amazing things, protect us in this season. And yeah, God bless you. Thank you for watching today. Uh, Kuna Matata. <laughs> yeah. Um, so also, in light of the pandemic that we're in, I just want to remind everyone to be safe. You guys have probably heard this a lot, seen it a lot on the internet, but, and also just, um, don't, don't stop meeting together. Um, even if it can't be in person, text, call. Um, I know that we need to socially distance, but don't emotionally or spiritually distance yourself from anyone. And we're here. Shoot me a message if you want to connect. Yes. Do yeah. It. Do it. So Do it. we want Do to keep it. this community up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Do it. Yeah, we just want to keep this community full of life and just keep on encouraging each other. So I think that goes into our koinonia portion, which clearly has to look a little different because there's only four of us here. But we are going to find one random. Oh, my head keeps getting cut off. Okay, we're gonna have phone up one random UCMer. They don't know that we're doing this from my phone book, and we're gonna ask them the Koinonia question, which is, what are some activities or maybe new skills that you're gonna learn while you are quarantined or socially distancing? Does anyone have an answer? Anyone want to answer? Fishing. <laughs> Jerson's gonna go fishing. I actually already started playing guitar. Um, we bought a volleyball, uh, bought some bubbles, slacklining, lots of things that I'm going to learn. Guitar. It's a good one. Mm-hmm. Julie, what are you, I mean, Abby, what are you going to do? <laughs> mm, I'm going to ride my horses a lot. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> no. Jason already said fishing. Well, can I go out? I want to go again. I you can, can go out. Go for a bike can, ride. Yeah, totally. You, you can just go can't for be like in close quarters with yeah, people. Yeah, you can go for a bike ride. Like, and and play guitar. Nice. And read books. Yeah, yeah read a lot of books. time to stay inside and read books. Hello? Hi Kayla. Hey. Did I catch you at a good time? Yeah, I'm just on my lunch. How's oh, going? cool. Good, good. We are just filming the UCM. And we're doing the Quinonia segment. So you're actually on the UCM video slash vlog for this week. So we're gonna ask you the Quinonia question. Sound good? Okay. Okay, so the Koinonia question is, what new skills or hobbies are you going to pick up during this time of social distancing? Oh boy, that is a good hard pressing question. Um, I am going to practice probably um, doing things exactly when I need to do them, mm. if that makes sense. Like not procrastinating. Like, yeah, like dishes and meal planning and grocery shopping if I can even get to do grocery shopping. <laughs> mm. um, yeah, that kind of stuff. Good call. That's mm -hmm. a good one. Thanks, yeah. Kayla. Okay. Have fun. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Goodbye. Yeah,
just keep going at guitar, I guess. Yeah. yeah. That's a good one, Kiara. You're rocking it. <laughs> Hi, Julie. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was just planning on, like, reading more, playing more guitar, just, like, doing more stuff I already like. <laughs> nice. Um, well, um, I was in the middle of one, right as you called, so I'm kind of mad, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> um, I still have uh, a minute 30 left on the timer. <laughs> are you, like, planking or something? <laughs> what? What are you doing? I have a minute 30 left on the timer when you called. Are you baking? <laughs> are we supposed to guess? No. Are you, like, are you writing a test? <laughs> I'm down at the beach right now by my lonesome. Oh, shove a time? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was like literally what I was doing as you called. So I'm kind of sad that I like uh, had to stop. Oh. I was like, oh, this could be semi-important, maybe. Well, it's very important, okay? <laughs> so I don't want to interrupt yeah. you with that. So. Okay. Yeah. So that 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 would be mine. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Welcome again to my living room, and I would like to introduce our very special speaker for this week. It's Amanda. She is wonderful. Um, she's staff here at Wawa Nanaimo, and she's been involved with UCM for, I guess, this whole year, and has been really great in the kitchen and um, giving guidance and stuff. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thanks. Do you want me to pray for you? Yeah. Pray for you. Okay, we'll lay on the pillows. <laughs> Dude, Jesus, thank you so much for Amanda, and thank you for the wisdom um, that you have gifted her with, Lord. And I just thank you that, um, yeah, she has been adaptable, and she's here, and she's ready to share your word, Lord. And, um, Lord, even though it's in a different format, I just pray that it will bless everyone that is listening to it and that it will reach even more people through this, this format, Lord. Um, so, Jesus, I just pray that you pour your Holy Spirit into her, and I just pray that she speaks your words so powerfully here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks. Okay. Um, I want to say thanks to you guys for joining us. Uh, this is a really strange time. And it feels everywhere I go like people are either panicking and totally freaking out or entirely in denial about what's going on around us. And so I have a really strong sense that as God's people in this time that we're called to be beacons of light and beacons of peace uh, and that we are to know what our hope is in. Uh, we, we're going to look today at a section of scripture that talks about God's heart and it's going to lead to some practices that will fuel and sustain passion. Uh, yeah. I don't know why you're here, if it's because you're bored and you don't have anything better to do, uh, or if it's because you really miss UCM and you really wanted to be there tonight. Um, but on some level, I know that it's because you're hungry for more of God and that you want to know more about who God is. And so I want to encourage you that that hunger is so good to keep seeking God and keep wrestling with Him and don't be satisfied with anything less than Jesus and His truth. And when we're in times of change and times of shifting, often those are times when we ask lots of really deep questions and lots of hard questions. And I want to encourage you to keep asking those in this time. Don't be afraid, don't shrink back, uh, but ask the questions, wrestle in prayer, wrestle with the scripture, and even though our social gatherings are limited, we still in this time have lots of options for talking to people. So if you have people in your life, even if you don't find them, uh, that you can write messages to, that you can have phone conversations with, that can listen to your questions and maybe ask you more questions and encourage you to wrestle with God, I want to encourage you to make use of that in this season. I also want to remind you of our hope uh, that we have as Christians, real and true hope. And our hope isn't that, oh no, the disease won't touch us. Um, but our hope is really that we have eternal life, that we have confidence in who Jesus is, that we look at the things that are unseen because those things are eternal. Um, yeah, we have that real hope to offer the world. And so I want to encourage you, if, if you don't have your confidence in that, 
that, let that be the first thing that you wrestle with in this season. So before we go any further, uh, I want to do two things. First, uh, I want to encourage you to go grab your Bible because, or pull out your phone. You can pause. This is the benefit of this pause. Go get your Bible. Let this be a season in which the Word dwells richly in you. And you can turn to Micah chapter 6. Just put your finger there. It's uh, near the end of the Old Testament. So Micah 6. Uh, secondly, um, I want to speak to you guys for a minute as somebody who has kind of been around the edges of the UCM community this year and has watched you guys, and has served with you, and has prayed with you, and prayed for you. Uh, I want to just take this opportunity, since I have the microphone, to really commend your leaders. Um, your student leaders, you guys, I, I think after the last few weeks, you all know who they are. They have been called on this year to do a lot more than what it is they signed up for. And they have all risen up really beautifully. They have stepped up and they have served, um, and, and they have they've not shrunk back, but they have walked with courage and with wisdom, and I want to commend them publicly for that. Uh, Jesus said that uh, those who would be first will be the servant of all, and these guys have served you with prayer and with integrity and with hearts after God. And so if you get the chance, Thank them for that. They've been amazing. Okay, let's turn to Micah. I'm going to start in chapter 6, verses 13 to 15. Um, Therefore, I strike you with a grievous blow, making you desolate because of your sins. You shall eat but not be satisfied, and there shall be hunger within you. You shall put away but not preserve, and what you preserve I will give to the sword. You shall sow but not reap. You shall tread olives, but not anoint yourselves with oil. You shall tread grapes, but not drink wine. I'm going to say the university student translation of this is, you will study for months and still fail your exams. That's what this means. Yeah, I know. Pen. But this is, this is what God is calling. And so this is kind of what I imagine when I imagine the voice of the Old Testament prophets, that they were speaking punishment. That they were saying, it doesn't matter what you do, you're going to fail. God's against you. God's out to get you. Uh, but I want to take it back and say, oh, yeah, these are, are some of the curses that he's proclaiming. But I want to go back to some of the earlier verses. So going back to verse 3 to verse 5. He says, oh my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember what Balak king of Moab devised, and what Balaam the son of Beor answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. He's referencing their history there. He talks about Egypt, and Moses, and Balak, and Balaam, and Shittim, and Gilgal. And so he's referencing, yeah, things that have happened there. These things and these places and these people were 750 years in the past for the people that Micah was talking to, which is kind of hard for those of us who live in North America to imagine because 750 years ago, we don't really have history for that. It was before the printing press. It's ancient history. But for this, for them, it was an ancient history. It was really their defining moment when they became a nation. It was something that, that they talked about and something that had defined them. And so I originally actually worked on this message over a month ago. It was quite a while ago. Uh, and I was trying to think, what's that defining moment for this generation? What's something that you would identify with? And, and I was thinking, I was trying to go 750 years back, and I thought, no. So I tried to think even in the last century, and I thought, we're not really in a society that tells stories. So we don't have stories passed down to us from, say, World War II. I know that my grandmother hoarded food in kind of a weird way because she grew up in Holland during World War II, but she almost never talked about it. So it wasn't something that, that was kind of in my memory. 
Um, and I was thinking about when I was in university, uh, one of the things that happened in my second year of university was uh, the planes flew into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center. And so that was actually really defining and changed a lot of the things that happened after that for all the people that lived through that. But I'm thinking most of you probably don't remember that, even if you've heard about it. Uh, but I realized as I was reworking the message this week that we're actually in the middle of one of those times right now. This is a time that you're going to remember your whole life. And so just as if people say, they say 9-11, and I go, oh yeah, here's, this is my feeling, and this is my story, and this is what I experienced, even from as far out as I was. And this is the way I saw the world change after. Uh, we're in one of those moments right now where however many, 10, 50 years from now, people will say the word pandemic, and you'll think about this time, and you'll think about all the ways that you watch the world change in the years to come after. I'm really enjoying the jokes. You know, that in 9 to 11 months, we're going to have a baby boom, and we'll call them the coronials. <laughs> And then, in 2033, there'll be the quarantines. Ha, ha, ha. See? It's funny. But there'll be those words that will bring up memories for you. There'll be key words that, that come out of this. And so, these words for these guys, when they say Egypt, when they say Moses, it brings up this sort of communal memory. And we lose that now when we read it, because we don't really have a sense of, of, of what this means. Um, so I'm hoping this is where you guys get to help. Do you guys know what Egypt represented for the Israelites and Moses? Ten Commandments. Exile. <laughs> Exile. Freedom. Exile. Freedom. Yeah. Yeah. They were slaves in Egypt, and Moses was brought to them as a deliverer. And so being slaves was, was very imprinted on their memory and being free. So God is reminding them, I brought you out of slavery and I brought you to freedom. Um, do you guys know about Balaam and Balak? This is where you guys are really on the spot for those at home. Good job being brave. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. What do, do you have some kind of... Balak was a prophet. Okay. But like from another nation. Uh, some, yeah. Something. Do you guys think, most people think of Balaam's donkey. Does that, yeah? Okay, so there's, so this is where, if you don't know, if you, if you plug this in, you don't even need a Bible search for this. If you plug into Google, it'll take you back to Numbers 22, and it'll tell the story where the Israelites had come out of Egypt, and this, this neighboring country, Balak, he tried to get a prophet, Balaam, and he tried to pay him to curse the Israelites. Yeah. And it's this whole kind of funny story where he tries to pay him to curse the Israelites and instead he bless says blessing. blessing. Yeah, mm -hmm. he speaks blessing. Mm -hmm. And then there's an angel on the road blocking and his, he doesn't see it but his donkey sees it and then his donkey talks to him. Oh. Um, so it's, but it's this whole story of even when people were trying to curse you, I changed it to blessing. Mm -hmm. So then if we go Shittim and Gilgal... I'm like, nothing, hey? That's, that's where I was at when I, when I was reading this. I was like, oh, nothing. So I went and looked it up. And again, just, just even plugging it into Google gets you immediately to where you're at. So Shittim um, is talked about in Numbers 25. So again, we have the Israelites. They have been in slavery for 400 years. So they've only known slavery. They haven't known anything else except for making bricks and being told what to do. And then God came and brought plagues on the Egyptians, crazy plagues, and he wouldn't let them go. Then finally he did, and he parted the sea, and they came miraculously through the sea, and he has been feeding them miraculously. And so then in Numbers 25, they're at, they're at Shittim, and they're camped there. And they start worshiping other gods. Um, and it's easy for me to, to look at that and be judgmental, but I know God has done incredible things in my life, and still, I lose faith, I lose trust, I have moments where I, yeah, think that all is lost. 
And so this is what happened there from Shittim. It was their last camp in the wilderness before they crossed over the Jordan. And so they camped there. They worshipped other gods. They recommitted themselves to God. And then they crossed over the Jordan River. And they crossed into the land that had been promised them. God had promised this land to Abraham 400 years in the past. And then he had promised it to them when they left slavery in Egypt 40 years before. So when you feel like it's taking a long time for God to come through on what he has promised, think about the Israelites. Uh, this, was, this was a huge promise. And so they crossed this river. And then the first place that they camped on the other side was at Gilgal. So again, plug into Google, Gilgal, it'll get you to Joshua 4 and Joshua 5. It was the first place that they stayed in the Promised Land. Uh, they had been waiting centuries for this and trusting and believing God. And a few things happened there. The first thing was they had been eating the supernatural manna in the wilderness. And this was where they first ate real food. That was always the promise. God was going to bring them into a land of milk and honey that it would be a land that would provide for them. And so this was the place where they actually tasted with their mouths that promise. It was also the place where they were circumcised. They didn't get circumcised in the wilderness. And so they circumcised all the men. Uh, it was a sign of agreement. It was a sign of faithfulness to God. It was like a wedding ring. And what it says in the text is that it took away the shame and reproach of their slavery in Egypt. So all their inferiority that they'd been carrying, all the shame that they'd been carrying, that was taken off when they were circumcised at Gilgal. So through this whole passage, God is referencing who they are. He's talking about the stories that have shaped them. Um, Haley mentioned that I've been with YWAM. I've been with YWAM since 2002, and I keep hearing stories about how YWAM started, and, and YWAM in Canada specifically, and at first I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, this is kind of cool, but the longer I listen, the more I realize these stories have shaped the people that I'm with, and my community, they've shaped me, and the more I listen to how important they are. And I'm sure all of you are part of various families and communities. I wanted to highlight, I've listened over the last few months, and Seth's been here, and he's let some things drop as he's been here about the history of UCM. And I want to encourage you to listen. When people are talking about families that you're a part of, listen and honor when they talk about the history, because it's your history, and it's your story, and it's the background for, for the people that you have become a part of. So ask those questions. Find out. Find out what went before to get us to where we are now. I also want to point out that there's tenderness in the reprimand. Uh, starting in verse 3 and also in verse 5, he says, Oh, my people. He's not saying, <laughs> he's not saying you people. Uh, he's not speaking harshly. He's, you can hear his heart in that phrase, in the, oh my people. Uh, and then he's saying, you've taken me for granted. You've taken our history for granted. And he asks the question, how have I wearied you? And so I want to ask you if there are places where you've become weary, and if you're going through the motions without passion and without thankfulness. When God rescued the Israelites from Egypt, they made an agreement uh, as they came out in the Exodus. And it's a lot of laws, it's a lot of rules, but the agreement was designed to help them remember who God is and what he has done for them. He told them to talk to their children about what had happened. He told them to tie it on their hands and to bind it on their foreheads between their eyes. He told them to write it on their doorposts and on their gates. And so I have some things like that that, that I have that, that remind me of some of the crucial stories and things that God has spoken to me. 
So I have one. I have a necklace. A few years ago, we went through a really traumatic event. And after that, this woman gave me a necklace. And it was this big, it's like, it's so not my style. It's this big kind of gaudy necklace. But it says on it, hope is an anchor for the soul. And so I thought, okay, this is a thing I need to remember. Uh, and I put it on, put it around my neck, and I wore it for, for maybe a week or two. And, and then I broke the chain. And so I looked, I looked around for a chain that matched, and I, I didn't find one. So I just, I actually threw it in my purse, and it stayed there. It just stayed in my purse. It's kind of a black hole. It's my confession. Um, and a few months later, I went to visit a friend that I hadn't seen for quite a while. And I walked in and she says, I've prepared, a, I got a gift for you. And so she gives it to me and it's this necklace. And it's this little necklace and on it it says, hope is an anchor for my soul. And I thought, okay, people don't usually give me jewelry. I'm not a jewelry person, but here's, okay God, okay, that's funny. I wore it for one day and it broke the, ne the necklace piece just popped out and I realized, okay, this is like, what is going on? But I realized that the chain from the second necklace matched the first necklace. And what I felt like the Lord spoke to me through that was that our hope was broken, but he was going to restore it. Wow. And so I have that. And then a year later, uh, we were helping with a church plant, and when we left the community, some of the friends, uh, the, the church was called Harbor Fellowship. And so when we left, they said, we found this necklace, and I'm sure you can't see it, but it's got an anchor on it. And it says, hope is an anchor for the soul. <laughs> so uh, I wear this necklace to remind me of that community and to remind me always that God is going to restore my hope. Uh, and I wear it to, re to remember that God has a bit of a sense of humor and even if I don't quite get the message, he's going to keep repeating it for me. Um, okay, I have one more, but just because it's funny. A few years ago, I, we have had so much transition. My husband and I being in YWAM and all these things. And I was complaining to the Lord about it. And I was complaining about not being able to walk with people. And, um, and just some of the difficulty of that and some of the loneliness of that. And I felt like he asked me the question, well, what is it you miss the most? And what I said was, jokes. And after, I thought, that's a really weird answer. But that was what came up out of my heart. And so I was having this conversation on, on my morning walk. That's how I do my morning quiet time. And it was a day or two later. I was walking and I saw something on the ground. And I was like, what is that? It kind of looks like sushi. And I kind of kicked at it. And then I picked it up. Okay, this is where we have, to, we have to zoom in on this. And I started looking at it. And I was like, it's, it's like a cat. Um, I'm hoping you guys can see this. It's like a cat. And there's knitting needles. And it's a grandma cat. And there's a little doily. But it's also sushi. And this is the weirdest thing I've seen in a long time. And I felt like the Lord spoke to me and he said, it's joke. <laughs> so I've gotten a lot of mileage out of, out of my sushi cat. Um, my friends got me another one, so I have that on a keychain. And every time I see that... There's more than one. Anymore. There's, okay, so <laughs> it's a thing. I think it's Japanese. It, but I was like, God, it's kind of crazy that you made people that made this. Um, and it's been quite, yeah, it's been quite a joke for me. And so I hold these things, though. Every time I see my keychain, I think of it. Every time I put on my necklace, I think of it. And I realized a few weeks ago, uh, Pastor Wayne was speaking, and he kept talking about his ring. So I'm going to say, I already had this planned to talk to you about. So I want to say clearly the Lord, oh wait, let me go back. You might not know, but on the spectrum of people who would say the same things and still be Christians, <laughs> Pastor Wayne and I are very, very different people. Okay. See, I have notes. 
<laughs> We're very very different people. Um, but the Lord speaks in all sorts of ways, and I thought if this is something that's been emphasized a couple times in a couple weeks, I, I think the Lord is maybe trying to say something to you about jewelry and, and being reminded of what the Lord is speaking. So, I'm just going to throw that out there. God knows that we're forgetful, and so there's an emphasis on, on our memory, on reminding ourselves of what God is saying. Uh, so I'm going to emphasize again the discipline of a morning quiet time. I, I'm sure if you've been in the church for any period of time that you've heard this. Uh, I was struck again by, I, I listened to a message by Eugene Peterson uh, last year. And it was recorded shortly before he passed away. So Eugene Peterson wrote the paraphrase of the Bible, the message. Uh, it, it was the passion translation of its day. It was new and fresh. And it's actually a really incredible work, and it puts the scriptures into, into fresh perspective. So this is a man who, he's a scholar, and he's also a pastor, and he's written a whole bunch of books. They're great books. Go, go read them. Um, and he talked about what he was spending his time on. And he said his devotional practice was to read psalms, and he did it in a certain way. And most of how he was spending his time these days was helping people find their psalms and find their way of doing a morning devotional practice. And I thought, okay, if this is how that man, that man who has so much wisdom is spending his time, that must be a really important thing. So I want to encourage you to experiment with different practices that help encourage your devotional life. That time set apart and spent with God will never be wasted. Um, I also want to talk about another Peterson, not on purpose. His name's Andrew Peterson, and he's a musician. If you're bored in quarantine, go listen to his album. Um, the song on it is called The Dark Before the Dawn. It's one of his recent... It might not be your style of music, but his message is amazing. But one of his songs, he talks about uh, the first line of the verse is, They flew me down to Oklahoma City. And I'm pretty sure there was a bombing in the 90s at a federal building in Oklahoma City. And so when I hear that, I, I imagine that he's referencing they flew some musicians down to do some kind of concert after that. And in the next lines, he talks about being so sick he couldn't speak. And so you imagine, like, here's all these people, they're suffering, and you want to share what you have with them, but you can't speak. And then he says, he's at the microphone, and he hears the sound of the brothers by his side. And they were singing out my songs when the song in me had died. So this is about community. This is about having people around us who know our stories and who know our songs. Because no matter how good you are, at reminding yourself and remembering and at, at holding the Lord's word in front of you, there are going to be times when you forget. There are going to be days when you just can't anymore. And I'm sure we all know that. But if you have a community of people around you who also love Jesus and who know your stories, they will be able to sing those songs for you when you can. I'm going to end with two questions, and then I'm going to pray. Spend some time in the next few days asking yourself, what are the stories that God is calling you to remember? And how can you keep these stories in front of you so that you don't forget? Because we're on video, I'm not going to take a few quiet minutes to do that, but I want to encourage you when you stop to, to take some time to write it down, and to listen. What are the stories that God has used in my life? When has he moved? How can I remember that so I don't become forgetful? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to commune with you. I thank you for, for being in this time where we can hear your spirit and where we have your written and where we can read 
and where we have technology to be able to be together even when we can't actually be together. Father, I thank you for that grace. And Father, I pray for everybody who's heard this message that we would be reminded of the ways that you have worked in our lives and that we would take up the responsibility to continue to remind ourselves, to continue to remember and to not forget who you are and how good you have been to us. Amen. Mm -hmm. Be at peace.
was I sing for all that you died for me? Hey guys, I just want to thank you for tuning in. Um, and I hope that you were really blessed by by something tonight, whether it was the worship or Amanda's word. I was really blessed. Um, yeah, so that's about it for us for the year. So thank you so much for all the time and effort everyone has put into this UCM year. And I just want to thank you guys for watching. Um, stay tuned for some summer hangouts, possibly, depending on how this pandemic pans out. Um, so... Yeah, just thanks for watching and everyone be blessed. Bye.